the stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I'm going to be Bradshaw. That will be the WWE Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we got the former NWA Florida heavyweight champion, the former PC FCW Florida tag team champion with Xavier Woods before he was a king. We got two Okies and two Briscoes against one Texan. This isn't going to end well. We got Mr. Wes Briscoe. Wes, welcome to the show. Man, I'm so happy to be on you guys' show. About, about damn time you guys had me on your show. I mean, Well, I've on. wanted to have you for like a year or more. And Jerry's <laughs> the booker. And he says, I'm sorry, we're just full. We, we can't have Wes. I said, he's your son. He goes, I'm sorry, we can't have him. And it's funny oh. because old um, Jim Cornette said my dad never booked anything. Oh, oh, Jim, Jim, you Jim, Jim was Jim's a kid. He he wasn't around long at Cornet here on our show. Here, West is trying to get me in trouble with more of my friends here. So anyway, yeah, I, I always start this out by telling me let tell me a little bit about your background, but hell, I don't want to hear it. I already hey, heard. You know what? Let, let me start. Let me start. I want to ask this question. Because this is really important to, to, to let me to know. When was it that you realized that your dad was Satan? Uh, <laughs> soon as I popped out. The devil wound, himself. Soon as I popped out a wound and I started crying and he told me to shut up. <laughs> so, Wes, tell us. You're growing up there in Florida, and thank goodness, thank goodness, he moved you out of Oklahoma. That was a that was a good move. I'm very proud. I never was in Oklahoma. God bless you. God bless you, Wes Briscoe, for not being in Oklahoma. Actually, actually, Wes was born in North Carolina, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and for he lived there for six weeks, and then we brought him down here to get some sand in the shoes. <laughs> I never wear shoes or a shirt or anything. <laughs> Well, you did. You didn't even wear a diaper back then. You just went all free around here in this damn yard. That's the jungle sure the yard. <laughs> so, Wes, when when? But was tell it? us, tell us. Go ahead, John. I'm when sorry. was it? It's yours. Go, go ahead. <laughs> Jerry, this this happens all the time, Wes. All the freaking time. <laughs> and you saw us having to get on the the Zoom. We've only done this for like two years. And your your father, Mister Briscoe, still has some issues with technology. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, yeah. So, Wes, when was it that you realized that your dad and your uncle were two of the most famous people in Florida? I would or have, actually the country, but Florida specifically. Yeah, I would have to say to like be honest with you when I was six or seven, and we. I mean, we lived in the country, and so when we go to the grocery store or anywhere, and then everyone is staring, and I'm like, okay, something's up, and then we had the Briscoe Brothers Body Shop, which we would throw these huge Christmas parties, and all these famous people would show up, and then I'm like, who are my parents? Who is my dad and my uncle? And then I realized you know, what they have accomplished and what they have done and what they have done for our family. And it's pretty incredible to see it all involved because I got to see my dad evolve, you know, being a badass and then turn into the Stooges, which he will tell you, I got a lot in trouble in school because people would make fun of me and make be like, oh, your dad, was wearing a dress, kissing Pat, Pat, like, and I'd be like, really? Damn, like, and I get in trouble and I get suspended. And I didn't know my dad was an entertainer at the time. And it's- Heaven crazy. forbid your dad would smarten you up so you wouldn't get in trouble. <laughs> to be honest with you, my dad, when he came home, which I love him for this, when he came home, there was no wrestling. When he came home, it was us going outside, throwing the football in front of the lake and playing catch. It wasn't talking about, oh, we're going to watch Raw. It was me and my dad going outside and we'd throw the football right in front of the lake and we'd run like little screen plays. And we would like, that's what I remember. He never really put it, when he came home, he was a family man. 
my dad was always never about himself, never about, oh, check me out on TV. Or my dad was about spending time with his lovely wife, my mom, and of course me and my brother, Joe. But at, the, at that time, say 25 years ago, you're right, right at 40, right? 39, right? So when you're, when you're they calling out my age out, like <laughs> you're 29, no. like I said, you're I thought we were friends and stuff. Any of the brothers out there, you're, you're 29. And so, but when you were for, say 14 years old, you're in junior high, you're in high school. Attitude era was the highest rated wrestling era of all time. I mean, we did an 8.1 one time unopposed to TNT. Those numbers will never be done again, except for maybe something like the NFL or the world cup. Uh, your dad was one of the primary characters of Monday Night Raw. He was on every single show. Yeah, and I got it was never the temptation for you to say, "Hey, Dad, where you guys were in Roanoke, you guys were in the Garden, you guys were in the Staples Center." You never talked about that. It was just when you came home. It was just family time. Not because I got picked on for stuff like that. I got picked on like because at that time I wasn't quite in high school. It was kind of in between of me being in that like about to be in high school and growing into your own and like so I got picked on I got like made fun of I got people you know saying oh your dad did this on tv I like and I grew up knowing my dad as a badass you know so like it was very hard for me to understand what was truly going on that my dad was being entertained for. my dad was you know making people laugh creating you know, great ratings, creating great memories. But for me as a kid, it was, you know, people picking on me, people saying, oh, I saw your dad did this. I saw your dad do that. Like, and for me, like, I'm, I'm just like my dad, I'm hard headed. So you come up with me and say some smart stuff, I'm probably going to hit you. And that got me in a lot of trouble. But I didn't realize until I started working that my dad was being entertaining my dad was it, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you draw money as long as you put asses in seats and and get those numbers that's all that matters and being entertaining and being full of life and energy and not being scared to go outside of your own character and i you know of course as a kid you don't know that stuff as a kid i'm a hard-headed kid i'm like nah you know so that's where it kind of went with that you know, it's the old adage in wrestling, you know, the smart guys always play the dumb guys and the tough guys always play the cowards. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just kind of how it's always happened. You oh, know? Yeah, John, 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 what would, what, what, he was growing up. I mean, as you told us, I said, I mean, you know, we were crazy and raw and uh, my wife being a school teacher, Wes is my mom, a teacher and everything. I mean, we didn't, uh, we didn't let them watch an awful lot of uh, Monday Night Raw TV because it was, it was, you know, they were kids, and uh, <laughs> I, we would TV unless Wes would sneak in his room and turn on the TV. He didn't watch a whole lot of it. So what he was getting was the kids' feedback at school, which was very, very cruel. And my wife had to go down. Fortunately, the principal at the school down here was a good friend and a, and a, a tremendous wrestling fan, you know, and, and, and a, just a great, great school principal. She knew me and she understand, understood what was going on, but a lot of the teachers and a lot of students, I mean, both my boys were harassed, you know, of course, uh, the, the crowning point was wearing the dress uh, you know, <laughs> on TV and everything, but I remember the young one, uh, and I think Wes was there too, but the first time he had ever experienced it, it was probably like in the fourth grade. Well, Bubba was, a, believe it or not, a beloved, a beloved baby face here in, in, in Tampa, you know, on a radio show, so people were on his side, and I was one of the evil, evil students, so when I went out in the ring against Bubba, ever they started chatting, Briscoe, asshole, uh, you know, that old Monday Night Raw chap, asshole. Joe, Joe had never, never experienced anything like that. And he, why are these people calling uh, my dad an asshole, you know? And, uh, and the, uh, the young lady that, that we had uh, uh, watching after him had to explain to, well, your dad's a bad guy. And no, my dad, not, but, you know, he had actually brought him to, that's one of the reasons why we just didn't allow a lot that I knew it was going to be funny instead of, you know, kind of Roger or something like that. I would, I would tune into it and let them watch it. But 
Otherwise, you know, we, we didn't watch a whole lot of wrestling. So the feedback they got was all that, you know, from teenagers who were, you know, kind of brutal. And uh, Wes did get in trouble. He did punch a few guys in the faces every once in a while. You know, and I had to go down and talk to the principal. <laughs> Yeah, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was kind of rough on them coming up, and uh, so it was totally different, I think. Dad, we really need to work on your internet. I'm telling you, Jerry, you're, you're, what is wrong with your internet? I know. Like, why do you keep cutting? You're in the office, right? Yeah, where you're mine, or is it mine, or is it yours? <laughs> no, me and, me, me and John, well, me and John are perfect. We be... <laughs> <laughs> You guys are the ones freezing up on me. I'm not freezing up on me. <laughs> Wes, will you go over and talk and help your dad with his internet, please? Um, <laughs> I've told him to get boosters. I've told him all this stuff. He doesn't do nothing. I I got a damn pod right back here. Is and it the, a phone? Yeah, and, and the router hey, is almost six dollars right. extra a month for the damn thing. And the best part is, Wes, is is like. Every week he'll say so and so's internet was bad. No, no, Jerry, it's your <laughs> it's your internet. It's not, it's not the other guy's internet. But yeah, growing up, you know, it it was tough, you know. And then finally I reached the stage where I knew, you know, what my dad was doing and how he was providing for the family and you know what entertainment he was providing the whole entire world. Because at the time, I didn't know that he was in entertaining the whole entire world. Like, that is crazy for your father to be out there and entertain the whole entire world and draw one of the highest ratings Raw has ever got? Oh, my God goodness like that's a feat that no one else could ever say that they ever done and for my father to be able to do that at the time yes i didn't recognize that but now whoo i, I mean and, and i wish I half the wrestlers up. could even think they could draw a rating like that and wes i want to bring up something about that quarter hour rating okay the first part of that quarter hour was jbl bradshaw versus ron simmons then it was Mr. Briscoe and Mr. Patterson. So the, the 8.6, I'm not sure who drew it, but we were both in it. All right. Ron, I'm just glad Ron was my lead in. <laughs> I'm just glad Ron Simmons wasn't my lead in, John. <laughs> you know what the bad part, Wes, was about that punching people in the face? Jerry was doing that at the same time at work. So mainly to me and Bruce Pritchard. <laughs> Well, this is this is a story that I have. Okay, you want to ask me when I know when my dad was an asshole. When did you know that he was an asshole? Because for what I heard is you guys used to pick on him, so he would have to fight back and actually show him that you got, that he could actually wrestle. That's the story that he tells at Thanksgiving. I can tell that's the home version that he told. That's his side First of the story. Thanksgiving doesn't happen in our family because oh, that's right. Yeah, that's that right. Guy, that's that, that guy awesome. invaded our property. What are you talking about? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> talking about you know, we don't we don't celebrate that. I like, got a Thanksgiving for Jen, and I got both Briscoes mad. <laughs> No, we Native American. He stole this land, boy. He stole my land. <laughs> you know, your yeah. uncle came in one time and saw a bunch of Texas magazines that your dad had, and uh, they, <laughs> I don't, I don't know how they got subscriptions to all those Texas magazines for years. You want, you want to hear a crazy story? <laughs> so I was sitting next to Mike Rotundo, and. Uh, Mike Rotundo was like, I always, whenever I get the opportunity to sit next to a legend, I always get like to ask a story about my uncle because my uncle meant the world to me. And I don't really get to hear too many wrestling stories about my uncle unless I get to talk to, you know, people that's been in the ring or been around my uncle. So I'm sitting there. And uh, Mike was like, yeah, you want me to tell you a cool story about your uncle? I'm like, yeah, let me hear a cool story about Jack. So apparently, I guess, my dad and Jack were tagging. And they showed up a little bit late. And they, uh, Wahoo McDaniel was the uh, agent. 
and uh, not Wahoo Mike Daniel. Get not Wahoo Mike Daniel. Uh, uh, Chief uh, right. uh, Strombo. Yeah. Sorry, Chief, Chief J. Strombo was Joe Scarpa. What was the, was the uh, agent? And uh, he, he comes up to Jack and goes, "You guys are late. I'm finding you." And Jack looks around, says, "You finding who?" And he looks around and he goes, you guys, he goes, I ain't listened to no fake ass Indian. <laughs> he goes, and then he lights up a marble red cigarette, blows it in his face and goes, what you fake ass Indian going to do? And guess what happened? He just walked out the door. Didn't want nothing to do with Jack. And we didn't get fined. And you didn't get <laughs> when I heard that story, I was like, Rotundo, for real? He goes, yeah, Jack was going to whoop his ass. He goes, he goes, he hated that fake Indian. He goes, all he would always call him Joe. He would never, ever call him by his real name. <laughs> so, so what did he well, know? Like? <laughs> well, his real name was Joe. Yeah, right? he, yeah, he'd, he'd, he'd never he'd never use anything but Joe. But they, they had a really good tight relationship in the early, and uh, and then Joe, of course, went off and became a uh, Jay Strongbow. And uh, he would when he'd come down on vacation, he'd work and he'd want to use the name uh, uh, Jay Strongbow. Eddie would never let him use that name down here until later on, and because you know. Everybody here knew him. Well, Joe would get mad, you know, and Jack knew that that made Joe mad. So, Scarfer Scarfer was always, "Don't call me uh, Joe, call me Jake." And then so Jack, Jack said, "Fuck, I've known you forever as Joe. I'm going to use the name uh, Joe." So, that that always made uh, Scarfer really really upset. So, uh, yeah, when 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 we were up, up there working, and Jack Jack really didn't want to be there to begin with. He was there doing George Scott and Vince uh, a favor. And Scarp coming in and say, I'm going to fine you. You know, Jack said, no, you're not. We just happened to be coming out of Atlanta, which Jack had some several properties up there. We had several properties up there. And we were checking them out before we went to the building. So we got caught in traffic and got walked into the building. And before he said hello or anything, he just jumped all over Jack. He could have come to me first and been a hell of a lot better off. But he chose to go to Jack because he'd known Jack the longest. And Jack, Jack was in no mood for for his playing around you know and jack just chewed his ass out and that was the end of it and i got a call from george did your brother get on joe i said yeah yeah he did and he said well, well he mike, can do that and i said well mike mike what? mike said that joe the look in joe's eyes because i guess jack must have had a really bad day because the look in joe's eyes from what mike told me was holy moly i better get out of this locker room before yeah. Especially when Jack lit up the Marlboro Red and blew it right in his face, he was like, "Well, oh. you know your, you know your uncle Jack uh, West. He he didn't he didn't like to put up with any of that stuff. And he, you know, he, you know, and, and, and Joe just caught him at a time where he shouldn't have caught him. You know, and especially when you say you're going to get fined, you know, for something, and you're five minutes late, maybe maybe ten minutes late. It's one of those old, you know, I got your name written down to your time slot punch on." On here too. You're ten minutes late. I'm gonna find New York night's pay. You know, come on. <laughs> but that's how it was, you know. But uh, Jack said, "No, you're not." And uh, you know, and so that 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 that, that, was that story. But Mike Rotundo told West that story. They called me. Mike and West called me that night after they told the story, laughing and everything. Called me. Do uh, you remember that? And I, after Mike told it to me a couple of times, I started remembering the circumstances. <laughs> but. Mike said, I never seen anything like it. Joe just turned tail and just ran out of there. He didn't want to play oh, with Jack. Yeah, you know? Mike said he so West, West kind of knew all along that that West kind of knew all along that Jack Jack was the big brother in, in our family, you know, and uh, he, he, he was the one that, that spoke up most of the time. But uh, Jack and Wes had a really great relationship. Uh, Jack lived a couple of miles from us, and Wes had a had a running trail when he was running, uh, doing amateur wrestling. It's a five mile trail. Uh, we'll run over and, and Jack knew what time he's going to run. He'd kind of, you know, coach along behind West as he running. They'd, they'd be up with each other, which was, 
I loved it to death because my son was getting a chance to get to know his uncle and everything. So it was really cool. Yeah, those are really tell, good. Tell John and, and the listeners out there, you know, your your first love was wakeboard. We lived on a lake here, and, uh, you know, you were all this wakeboarding stuff on TV. And we, we didn't have a boat. We had a jet ski at the time. So you went out and you tied a rope around. I always had trampolines around for you guys to jump on. And you tied a rope around palm tree. You started doing the... Uh, the tricks that you were seeing on ESP and wakeboarding, and they had a tournament. I think it was Hyperlite or somebody like that. And you went out and you blew everybody away when Hyperlite signed your right off the boat. That tell 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 them a little bit. Yeah. So at the time, I was probably about sixteen, seventeen, and you know, of course, I'm playing oh, football. I'm doing amateur wrestling. I'm doing karate, doing boxing, I'm doing every single sport you could ever picture. But then extreme sports kind of you know, pushed me to a, a different thing because when you grow up getting drilled by the normal sports, sometimes you get burnt out or you kind of want to create your own path. You want to be your own Briscoe. You want to be your own person. So I saw this wake morning. I saw this guy doing flips and spins on my leg. And I'm like, man, this looks really, really cool. So eventually I like flagged the guy down. I was like, Hey, like I'll give you gas money. Can you teach me? And luckily the guy was nice enough, knew who my dad was, was a big fan of my dad. So then he started, I was like, yeah, come on the boat. Started teaching me and I got good. And then I started progressing and I got really good where I was able to turn pro at 18. So at 17, I'm in high school and I'm juggling all these sports. And then as soon as I turn 18, I get offered a pretty good contract to go travel the world and be a professional wakeboarder. And of course, I'm used to wrestling every single day. I'm used to karate. I'm used to, you know, boxing. I'm used to football. I'm used to drill. Like, so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go separate myself and create my own path create my own West Briscoe, which I was so blessed to do with my own pro model West Briscoe board, which is one of my most proudest achievements. Not too many people have their own professional board that was sold. This board was sold all around the world. I still get messages from people saying, hey, I got your board. I would love to you for you to sign it. But to okay to jump back to so i became a pro at 18 started traveling the world starting to really get on my own path and then i get hurt when i got John, he has he has a tour bus at 18 with his pitch with his pitcher on the side of the damn tour bus going around the country <laughs> oh i've been, I've been oh I, at, at 18 i've been at 18 i already went through a passport like i went through every single country you could ever think of imagine being 18 and like it okay for us pro wakeboarders when we go to a country is way different from wrestling like wrestling kind of sucks going to another country because y'all are in and out when we're there we're there for a week we're there with the locals where they're like you know they show us the spots like we like when we were going to Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Israel, like we were there for like 14 days with locals, not trapped inside a stadium building, going to look for the coolest spots to ride to get the best photos so we could be in the magazines and the videos. And people were like, wow, look at that photo of West Briscoe in Israel or Thailand or Singapore, or Australia or, you know, so that experience was really cool because I got, con I got connections all around the world where it wasn't just checking into a building, wrestling, going to the hotel, maybe having one day off, going to the next spot. No, when we were there wakeboarding, we were there for a while. So we got to see the country. We got to experience the people. We got to like hang out. We got to like, you know, create bonds with people all around the world, which you guys did too. But it was totally different because I did, of course, when I was with TNA, 
you know, I, I wrestled in London and Europe and all over there. You, you're from building the building. You don't really get to experience the culture, the people, because you're too busy. You got the next show the next week. You got to be here. You got to be there. With wakeboarding, we're trying to find the coolest scenery. We're trying to eat at the nicest, right? Like, it was a totally different scene. And um, I was blessed to be able to be a part of it. Yeah, so you got to go to like the beautiful lakes and the beautiful places where you have these incredible pictures taken for all the magazines and the videos. I got to sit on a bus across from your dad. Oh. <laughs> I'm sitting, I'm sitting, it's in here at home one time. I get something from the mail and it says Mexico on it. So I, I open it up. I took it's one of those Aero Mexico backseat magazine, you know, like a Delta, Delta Times or something like that. You get our American Airlines, you know, back, the magazines in the back seat. And I look at it on the damn cover of there's a picture of West Briscoe, my son. I open it up and there's like a 10 page spread of him wakeboarding in Mexico. And some some passenger on an airplane saw it, thought I'd like the magazine that he sent to me, man. How cool is that? that well, was because there. back in the day, I used to run a youth wakeboard camp in Acapulco. So Aero Mexico took that as, you know, hey, we're going to do some uh, publicity for this people because we're helping the youth, we're helping the community, we're giving back to the community. So they did a whole story about the guy that ran the camp for the youth group that I came down and taught wakeboarding to. So Aero Mexico picked that up and put that in their in-flight magazine, which I was totally blessed to be in. And during this time, during this time, Jerry, were, were, were you, how were you keeping up with it? Wes, were you living at home at this time and then traveling or, or where were you? Hell no. I'm, I moved out at 17. <laughs> I don't know. He moved out at too. Uh, he, he moved out as soon as he got, so he could get good internet. He moved. <laughs> That's exactly right. right. So they, they moved, I graduated from high school. He moved to Orlando. man. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Before I could even graduate, I was. Is it, hey, is it, is it you guys? Is it, is it you guys? Is internet that keep freezing up on me? Or no, what? it's because yours, I, Jerry. I'm, I'm Jerry, fine. Wes, I'm, your son Wes and mine, we see each other perfectly. Just like myself, and I look You're great. Frozen. I look at you guys, and you guys freeze up. But I, I I'm doing great here. <laughs> Wes, would you please I'm go look by at me, man? I can... <laughs> we definitely got to figure this out. So Wes, how long how long was the wakeboarding career? Well, the wakeboarding career lasted about to uh, twenty five. I had a major knee surgery, and I came back to stay with my parents at the time because it was I tore my ACL, PCL, MCL, lateral meniscus, and one one other thing. So I I I was pretty much out for a year. So I needed to be taken care of, and at the time I had no nobody to take care of me. So I went back home so my mom and my dad could help take care of me and stuff like that and um i remember going out and grabbing lunch with my uncle jack and sitting there and talking with jack and he never really talked about pro wrestling and then for some reason he mentioned it to me and it kind of just lit up a spark when my uncle mentioned it he's like you know, like, this be a, maybe a good time for you to try it out. And, you know, so I was like, you know what? I'll give it a shot. I mean, I, be, when I, before I graduated, I wrestled with Steve Kern. I did, I did some other, I did, I did some small stuff, but I really wanted to separate myself. I really wanted to create my own path and be like, Hey, I've done my own thing. If I come to wrestling, then I came to wrestling, but I, I was able to create my own path. So when I got the opportunity to get signed, it was really my uncle saying, hey, Wes, and I had that burning itch. Like, you know, like when you sit there and you like, man, you, you like think about it and you're like, I really want to get back in that ring. I really want to like just... Why do you think it was Jack instead of your dad? Is that so, is it was it, the reason I ask is that was that just a conversation that was easier for an uncle to have more than more than a dad to have? To be honest with you, 
me and my uncle, we had a different bond. We had, you know, my dad's being my dad. And my uncle was always the mediator, you know, because you know my dad. He's hard headed. He's really, stuck. really. Yeah, I've never, I've never heard of that before. Never, not one time. <laughs> well, he's hard headed. Your he's... dad has stretched me on every continent but Antarctica. <laughs> and I'm not going to Antarctica with him because I'm not giving him the satisfaction of stretching me on seven continents. So. You know, we had this talk and I, I love my uncle. My uncle meant the world to me. He was always there for me. Like my dad was saying when his internet was breaking up is that when I used to amateur wrestle, he knew my running route. So he would drive his pickup truck right beside me and roll down the window. And while I'm running, he would, you know, help make this make it easy you know i got like four sweats on a trash bag over me i'm like that's pretty cool that's pretty cool yeah yeah it's like you know 100 degrees and i'm just running and you know my uncle would pull up in his old ford truck and roll down the window and he would and and i would roll i would run old country roads you know back roads so you know he would just idle right beside him we would just talk and we would just bond and that was something that like those memories of me and him bonding. And it was funny because I told JJ Dillon this and he gave me this DVD that he filmed of, of all of them in Japan. And it's not like wrestling footage. It's all like footage of my uncle in the train station and going through immigration and them in hotel rooms. And he's like, Wes, I really think you would love this because it's like your uncle at his, at not him wrestling, but him just being, you know, Jack. And like, so when when he talked to me about wrestling, I, I was a little hesitant. And he's like, he's like, I think you would be really entertaining. I think you'd, you would have a skill set that's that these people would really like to see. So I was like, you know what? I, I'll give it a shot. So started wrestling. Luckily, I, I got signed by WWE. And then... I got there, and of course, as soon as I got there, I got bullied again. I got treated like, oh, you're just there because you're Jerry Briscoe's son. You're just there because you, and I wasn't there because of that. I was there because I wanted to kick some ass. I wanted to make a name for myself, and I wanted to prove myself. I was never the person to sit back and ride on my dad or my uncle's coattails. That's not who I am as a man. And a lot of people realized that. They were like, wow, wow, Wes is really here. And yes, I did struggle. Yes, I had some hard times where I almost got fired. And I remember Dr. Tom Pritchard and Norman Smiley pulling me back to the office and saying, hey, if you don't step it up, they're going to let you go. And you tell you what I did? I was the first person to practice. And I was the last person to leave. And then I even asked for extra practice. And I busted my ass. And then all of a sudden, Xavier Woods came around. And he, him, he Slater, and a couple other guys really, Joe Henning, really, really helped me out and taught me the ropes. And really allowed me to grow as a professional wrestler and show me I got what it takes to be in that ring. And, you know, it took some hard times. It took some failures. It took some, you know, hey, I got to, like, step it up. And then once I stepped it up, I realized, man, I loved it. And especially tagging me and Xavier Woods, he taught me so much. He is one of my best friends. He used to call me the wild one because he'd be like, It'd be funny because we'd wrestle bigger guys and they'd be like, oh, we don't want to bump for you. And I'd be like, well, I'll, I'll shoot, take you down. Like, like, you know, there was times where it's, Woods would be like, hey, Wes, calm down. Like, you know, I'm like, man, I don't care how big that dude is. Like, what, just because he's fat? Like, look at me, I'm jacked. Like, what? Like, I guarantee you I bench more than that guy. Like, you know, like, but so like, me and Xavier Woods, and then we flowed good together. We had a good chemistry. And then when we were tag champions, we were we were doing really well. And then Hunter called us and gave us the opportunity to start to be on Raw. 
So we got the opportunity. We had, I think, the whole month booked. And the last day of FCW, I did my finish off the top rope. And the guy missed me. And I blew my knee. And I tore my ACL, PCL, MCL, tore everything in my knee. They didn't think I was going to be able to walk again. So that kind of ended that, was able to rehab. And then by the time I got done to rehabbing, they let me go. And then and from Xavier there. Was, Xavier, when I thought Xavier, when Xavier became King, when he became King, King Woods, I thought that was one of the greatest characters ever. He was so good. With him and Kofi as his hand, it was. I, I just think Xavier is one of the most talented guys that we, we've ever had. He's he's so fun. He's so good at everything he does. Plus, he's a great athlete. Obviously, he's you know great looking body, all that stuff. But he, he really has a, a great mind for entertainment. And not only that, he's willing to help out the other talent. He's willing to make the match or make whatever he's doing the best that he can possibly do. He don't half ass nothing. And that's like me. So that was like when you when you put us together, we were like, oh, we were like Dusty loved us because we were like we just meshed really well together. We just we had that just that that flow. And um, I think your dad's back, but his picture isn't on. Jerry, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. <laughs> you ask, you see what I have to put up with every week? Every week. Well, it's that I... Oklahoma internet he's got. When I go down there for Christmas, so we'll try to sort this out. <laughs> yeah. How about you just actually pay for some like internet, you know, like actually get like decent internet. It's funny how that works. When you have like good internet, it works. <laughs> can you do that? <laughs> yeah. I think Wes can for you. Where's your picture, Jerry? I don't even know where I'm at, man. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I got, it says none here. Backgrounds. Video. Okay. <laughs> Best thing we do, Wes, is having a bunch of old wrestlers that are used to rotary dial telephones get on Zoom. It's the greatest <laughs> thing ever to watch them try to struggle with technology. Okay, you guys need to go to StreamYard. It's way easier. We're way doing easier. we're doing this poorly with Zoom, and we know Zoom well. We <laughs> we can't switch. <laughs> we'll never figure it out. So Wes, Wes, uh, ask, Wes uh, tell us the story about you and you and Dream. Uh, uh, you had you had some good experiences with Dusty uh, over there at NXT FCW. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience with Dusty. And Jerry, while he's doing that, why don't you find your camera and turn it on? I'm looking for it, John. I really am. I'm, I got Jerry's the one that will walk these wrestlers through the. Okay, if you look at the bottom left part of your screen, there's a camera with a line through it. Jerry's the one that does. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? I'm on here. He might, he might just need to upgrade his computer. I think that might be the issue. If his phone is working good, computer fine. Hey, I'm on the telephone now. Well, obviously your computer's not fine if you're on the telephone, and we got a great picture of you. There's well, so thank you, Wes. That is a great picture, man. You look great, Jerry. Thank you, John. Did West I miss anything? You little, what, what did I miss? You were a little hard-headed while you were all down on camera. And I, I, I found that hard to believe. My son would say something like that. He said he takes after you, and, and you're hard-headed. And, he, and he, was, he was telling me like as if it were news to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let, me, let me situate it here. I, I'm, I'm glad I've got, got back. I, this is, you know. I, I don't want to just show off how technically savvy I am to my son, but John, you messed me up. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. I mean, I got a microphone. I got all this stuff. How you, do you like, come on. So Wes, I want to ask you about this since your dad is back now and we don't know how long he'll be back. So <laughs> the, the time that your dad busted your nose in the wrestling ring. Oh, you heard about that? Yes. I, I heard about that. that. You told me that. <laughs> Who told I actually do doing watching your videos. He today. does research, Wes. We do research on this show so we can talk intelligently about it, people. That's yeah, right. I, see, no. sorry, I don't remember that. I just remember you getting in the way. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's your excuse. So my dad, when I first when I first signed WWE or FCW, my dad always 
didn't want to go there. He wanted the coaches to coach me. He did not want to step on anyone's toes. And that was the main thing he would tell me because I'd be like, why don't you come down there and help me? And he goes, that's not my job. <laughs> he goes, I got a whole other job. Like, you know, like, I think he was doing gorilla or whatever. Like, you ain't my responsibility. But he wanted the coaches because he didn't want to step on anyone's toes. So finally, I got to the level where I was able to have my dad in the ring with me. You know, it took a while. Like, it wasn't just like right away. It was, you know, we're finally where I kind of knew what I was doing. And he was like, all right, I'll come to the ring, but I don't want no one there. And so I asked Dusty, and of course, Dusty, everyone's like, oh, you know, all the coaches are, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, of course, everyone leaves the school. This is way after hours. You know, he shows up. We get in the ring. It's Norman Smiley, Dr. Tom Pritchard, and Dusty Rhodes, and Steve Kern. And that's it. And they're all circled around the ring. So I get in the ring, and I'm like, hey, like, what's up? Like, you know, typical me, like, what's, like, just laughing and joking and, you know, me kind of like making fun of the thing. And as soon as I go to turn around to lock up to my dad, boom. I was like. <laughs> I looked around. Isn't that illegal? I, it was, no, not where I'm from. Well, well first of all, well, hold on. Hold on. It was dead silence. I got my nose and I'm like, looked and I looked around and I started like kind of like almost tearing up and then I looked at my dad and my dad goes how dare you make fun of this sport laughing around in front of my peers the reason why I missed your Christmas the reason why I missed your birthdays was to put food on your table so out there to put a good job and you're out here in this ring making fun of what we're doing no nah. I'm going to prove you a lesson. And I'm like, okay, can I at least go clean it up? He goes, nope, we're going 45. <laughs> and we went 45 minutes with a broken nose. <laughs> Jerry, how did you choose the number 45? Uh, that's what you did down there, 45 minute time limit, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was bleeding it out my nose before we even started. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it probably had the best match you ever had, too, because you listened. <laughs> I, no, I, I, no, I went an hour with Dr. Tom. Yeah. I went an hour with Dr. Tom Pritchard. That was one of the best. That was really, really fun. So, Jerry, you don't feel bad about this tough love? Uh, you know, yeah, I do sometimes. Then I, <laughs> and then I look at the product and I said, you know, I could have been tougher. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Wes, it's okay. He did the same thing to me, and I wasn't making fun of anything. He just did it to me because I'm from Texas, which is a great place, a wonderful place. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, kind of like his son, you know. I'm kind of from a great place, too. <laughs> well, I'm his only friend, me and Bruce. <laughs> and he beat both of us up. Yep. Well, Eric still calls him every once in a while. Yeah, I was there when he when he beat up. I was there when he beat up Eric. I had that on video. One of the best stories ever. They're in their suits. They're completely in their they're in their full suits. Rolling. Oh, yeah, it was your fault. Whose fault? Whose fault was that, John? I mean, if we go back to relive the story, the best I can recall, I'm sitting there having a good time. It's my birthday. I guys who I think are my friends there that I, you know have no issues with. All of a sudden, you guys start riding me really unmercifully, and I, I got no choice. And Eric, Eric, thank goodness, he he really cooperated with me a hundred percent, you know, and put me over on my birthday. So I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, he you know. did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah, it took a lot to stir you up, as in very, very little, yeah. <laughs> as in almost none. Hey, but to Eric's credit, I, I give Eric a lot of credit. He goes, "Look, I'll give it a try." So to Eric's credit, he didn't he didn't back down. He didn't do well, but he didn't, he didn't back, back down. down. He didn't back down. And he even came for seconds. He did. He did. <laughs> yeah, he did. 
We, the first, we, we, the, the first we're one not, was so we're fast. We're not here to talk about Eric. We're here to talk about me. We're here to talk about me. This is my talk. You guys invited me. We're here to talk about me. Let's let's talk some more stories about me. <laughs> well, tell us a story. All right. Well, what do you, you guys want to hear? What do you guys want to hear about? Oh, we're here. Kurt Angle. Story, right? what, what would you What would you guys like? Me wrestling Drew McIntyre, Sheamus, like. What what type of stories do you guys want? Tell us a little bit about your wakeboarding. That's what I want to hear. I, I I've seen all the rafts and I want to see. I just your wakeboarding. <laughs> you were you were you were you were, you were really coming along with that. You tore your knee out. I tell John you'd qualified fifth in the world championships, I believe, and you'd qualified for the X Games, and you were you were training for that, and you were doing what back when the twelve forties were first coming out. Uh, on, yeah, on the, the wakeboard and yeah, yeah the 900s nine nine i thought you're doing the other re, re, uh, re, revolution too but anyway 900 that's that's when you came down wrong and tore your your tore your knee out right mm -hmm. yeah that's it was on uh one of my friend's birthdays just came home and i came home from i think i was in i think i was in israel and i came home and the next day, my buddy wanted to go ride for his birthday. And second trick, I did it and blew my knee out. And, then and if you had it. blown your knee out, what would a career look like in wakeboarding? I mean, do you, do you go to your th mid-30s? Is that same as, say, skateboarding with Tony Hawk, where you go, I guess, mid-30s is what, about what they do? I, I, I guess, no, you kind of go into coaching and you kind of go into, like, to be honest with you, there's really not much... But but he's asking your age limit and wakeboarding. That, that's, that's you're, you're about 25, right? 25 to 24 is your age limit. And about then, you're done. I mean, there's only, I mean, a few, maybe a top four or five people that will make a living for the rest of our lives on wakeboarding. Back in the day, it was different. But nowadays, no. It's changed. And, and so you were about at the, at the age limit where you're going to have to find a different occupation anyway, right? Exactly. And at the time, I was also coaching. I was also coaching wakeboarding at the time, and uh, which was, you know, I, I enjoyed coaching. <laughs> I enjoyed teaching the younger generation. And then, and then at that time, I got hurt, and then a couple of sponsors dropped me. And I was, my dad always told you, you're not pro unless you get paid. And I wasn't getting paid. So then I decided I got to figure something else out. You know, I could keep coaching, but I was still young and I still had dreams and I still wanted to do more in my life than just be a coach. So I was like, you know what? I had that talk with my uncle and I was like, you know what? And I love pro wrestling and I still love it to this day. I just had a match, um, on Sunday and, uh, I was telling my dad, it's been a while since I've came back and was really, really happy with, you know, my match and had a really good match. And I was excited to be back in the ring and, you know, getting the crowd excited again. Hey, Jerry, I was, uh, while well, you were busy in the abyss of the internet, uh, <laughs> me and Loss, I was asking Wes about his progression into wrestling. And he mentioned that, uh, his uncle Jack had talked to him when he took him out to dinner one time or they had lunch together as over a meal. Why, why was Jack the one that talked uh, to Wes and not you? Did you have the same idea? Did you talk to Jack about it? Was there, was there a reason? A lot of times it's easier for an uncle to talk to someone than a father, but was that part of it? What was the reasoning from your side? Well, John, you know, that it, 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 I certainly uh, wasn't one of those feel sorry for me, but, you know, I'd, I'd been through the deal. You know, my brother was an exceptional athlete, you know, as you know, and, and, and you know, and he always, always that comparison and that, that kind of stuck with me all my life. And I just didn't want my, my, my kids to have to go through that same comparison. That's the reason that, you know, I, I wanted Wes to wrestle and I wanted him to choose wrestling himself. And not 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 because of me, because I know that the pressures and, and and the bad comments, the hurtful comments that people make and everything, the comparison. And I just I just didn't want that. And I, I wanted Wes to make it as a wakeboarder. And uh, 
and uh, and uh, to be, to make his own name and to get out there in the public. And he was he was well on his way. He was you know he had he had contracts with sponsorship. We had a new boat every two years sitting at our at our at our lake. Uh, he had he showed you his wakeboard. We had wakeboards you know every day been set in the mail. Had all kinds of paraphernalia plus. I enjoyed that lifestyle too, because I go on a lot of these wakeboard tournaments and a lot of these wakeboard tournaments, they were sponsored by Hawaiian Tropic Tan. So you get there and those judges really like me, you know, and I, I'm, I'm an outgoing, I'm a likable guy, John, whether you believe it or not. Hey, Mr. Briscoe, you want to be a, a, a judge at the Miss Hawaiian Tropic contest? <laughs> Hell yes, I do, you know. <laughs> And so, okay, you know, I guess where they going after that. the contest. His lifestyle also, so I, you know, I was really wanting him to, uh, to, to make it, make it that sport, and he was well on his way until that ACL and MCL played a different, uh, had a different story for him in there. So after he, after he survived for that, so uh, that, that's kind of the reason, you know, I wasn't really pushing that direction, but then it came kind of pushed to shove and he gave up his, his, his uh, scholarship, you know, to go into wakeboarding, which of course his mom was dead set against, you know, and I wasn't real happy about it, but I understood too, you know, you got a chance to make some money at 18 years old. We're not talking about chump change. We're talking about, you know, and back in the eighties, pretty damn good money for an 18 year old, for a 50 year old, big good money. I didn't make the kind of money he was offered wrestling until I was about maybe six or seven years in the business, maybe even eight years in the business that, that I was making his opening money in that wakeboarding. Plus, you know, I went over to Orlando, I saw their tour bus and here's a big picture of your son on the damn side of this damn tour bus. I, I'm pretty proud. He's in all the damn magazines, you know, the, the, the trade magazines, wakeboard magazines, all that. Like I said, I got that Aero Mexico copy, you know, he was down in there. So, the guy was really spreading himself out and doing good. So then when he got hurt, you know, well, you, you, you don't have an education, you know, you, you don't have this, you're a pretty sharp guy, you know, you're an athletic guy. So wrestling, so I took him over Steve Kern. Joe Wessel will get mad at me when I tell you, I took him over. Steve had a little warehouse down there, some pre uh, F, uh, C, C, CWF or what FCW days, had a little warehouse not too far from the house where he's training these kids. Took West down there, wanted him to get in the ring. He got in the ring and he was he was he was a ugly duckling in that ring. <laughs> I mean, those ropes were completely foreign to him because, like I said, I didn't take him around wrestling a whole lot because I didn't really didn't want him exposed to that deal. And my wife really didn't want him exposed to that lifestyle there. So, uh, and wrestling lifestyle. So, you know, I took him down there. I knew if Steve would run him a little bit, and I talked to Steve. You know, run him a little bit, and he let him hit those ropes so his body will be sore tomorrow <laughs> so steve of course had him dropping down hitting the ropes dropping down getting again taking over and had a couple little hard bumps on on, on those hard reins that steve had and he was sore i didn't think it anything had happened but you know some damn light went off in his head i like this stuff and then he's he, he going behind my back talking to jack because he knows i'm not opening any doors for him and he and him, him and uncle jack were like this so uh he started talking to Uncle Jack, and Jack started coming over, taking him to lunch. And I didn't know what they were talking about lunch breaks. So it was none of my business, but they were talking about getting into wrestling. <laughs> and so that's kind of how that kind of morphed into, into being there was, you know, kind of behind my back because he wasn't getting the uh, the direction from me because I, I just wasn't giving it to him, you know. Wes, your, your dad stood back for obvious reasons because he's your dad and he's a very famous person and he wants you to make it on your own. What about your Uncle Jack, though? When you're breaking into the business, was was Jack Briscoe there to give you any type of advice or was he also the same way as I'm not going to get in the way of the coaches? Um, the day that he was supposed to come watch me wrestle was the day that me and Xavier Woods won the tag team championships and he passed away. So he never, I never wanted him to see me wrestle until I got the opportunity to be where I knew that I could actually wrestle. And when I finally got to that level, passed away. 
and he was supposed to be there. And I remember Steve Kern and Dusty pulled me to the side and they wanted to tell me before the inter before I guess I found out through the internet that my uncle passed. And he was like, You got you don't have to wrestle. You you guys don't and I was like, No, like my uncle would be he would beat my ass if I didn't go out there and wrestle. So of course I held it in and went in and out there wrestle. But no, he never never got the chance to I mean he did in heaven. You know, he probably got to see me wrestle Kurt Angle in the still cage match. I know I pray to God he did, but no, nah, he never he he never got the opportunity to see me in the ring. Did you ever talk to him about it? Like so after your training you come back home and, and you go out to eat with him. Did you ever talk to him about, hey, I'm training and he asked you anything about it? Did you talk to him about it at that point? Oh yeah, we, we would talk about it and he would ask about it, but for me, I'm the type of person, just like my dad, I'm not going to have someone come that I idolize to come see me wrestle when I know physically that I'm not where I need to be. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can tell when, like, when great people come to watch you wrestle, you want to be at your top of your level. You're not, you don't want to be like a uh, semi, like, so yeah, we talked about it, but you know, I always wanted him to actually get to see me in the ring. You know, that was something that I really wanted. John, he he, he asked more questions to me, I think, than uh, he did about my career or about anybody else. I mean, when he know that I was going down to uh, to Steve to watch to watch the kids work out, you know, and Jack wasn't in the best of health because he always wanted to come and he always called me, you know, I'm just not feeling well enough to go down there and and you you know the the fuss that everybody would make over Jack coming in that school. He did he didn't want that that type of tension and uh he wasn't well anyway. So but the next day at work, man, he'd I I had be an hour and a half just grilling me questions. Well, is he doing this? Is he is he doing the arm brag? Is he doing it the right way? You know, and and uh well, you can tell uh Bill DeMont. I mean, I used to give Bill DeMont hell because I always kidded, Bill, Bill, you teaching these kids that how to do a fat man uh, uh, lay filled out, arm drag. Not a, not a <laughs> Why you got to bring me in to build a butt? <laughs> just, just, just throw but Bill under the just, bus. Just a different style, you know, that, that, you know, Jack and I had put together a different style of work that, uh, that you know, it really it couldn't be taught. You know, you had to be somebody like Sneeboat or somebody like that to pick up that, that, that method and then, and kind of pattern your work after after Jack. So, uh, so it, it it was something that he wanted to be there, and it, but he just knew he wasn't physically able to be there. And Jack was a very prideful man that he didn't want to be seen, you know, in, in a real sick sickly state of of, of physical condition there. But uh, he asked more questions, and and uh, he was more interested in in Wes's pro career at in the beginning than than probably I was. <laughs> So what kind of uh, wrestling father were you, Jerry? Because I, I talked to Bob Orton a lot. You know, Bob and I are really good friends. Yeah. He's been, Bob helped me a lot in Japan when I first started. And I always ask him about Randy. I said, because uh, Bob's one, one of the best psychologists of yeah. all time, one of right. the best workers. Randy throws the same punch as Bob, by the way. Uh, but I'd ask Bob, how much do you help Randy? And, he, and Bob was very definitive. He said, only if Randy asked me. He said, you know, I, if he asks me, I'll, I will tell him stuff. Then, you know, because I don't want to get in his way of his mind creating what he needs in his own mind, not me, second generation. Was that how you were, Jerry? That, that's, that's, uh, that's exactly how it was because, John, you know, times have changed. Even now, I mean, even from from the time you're, you're getting to experience some of it, only not with your son, but with, with Corbin, you know. When you were getting over, it was a completely time different era and everything. And what these guys are getting over now, what got you over maybe won't work with some of these guys. You know, the basics always work. So the basics are always strong. So I always try to build that basic foundation with West, but I didn't know how to do a lot of this flip flop and fly bull stuff that they that they're doing. And I didn't pretend to, you know, what is West? he did teach me how to learn how to throw a punch and i recommend this to any wrestler if you want to throw a good punch you go in the shower or you go in front of a concrete wall and you throw punches 
And once you look like you are nailing that concrete wall and you're not hitting it, that's how you know. Most of the time, you end up busting your knuckles, but you do it enough. That's how I got my punches so good is my dad would say, go in the shower, hit the shower, go to a wall and just practice on the wall. Grab a grab a brick, practice kicking on a, like just little things, you know, like there's ways to learn how I would ask him that. And then when I finally got to the age when I was on TV and I was in TNA and I was doing a lot of things over there. Then I started asking him more psychology of, okay, he's like, okay, well, when their beauty shot goes, you cut in front and make sure you go up because you're a little bit smaller than Luke and Knox. Like, you know, like I, he would help me with little things like that and being able to show me little like, things. And then I want one day I ever, he laughed because I was like, I grabbed his hand. I'm like, no, we got to try and get the beauty shot. And he goes, Wes, I taught you well. Because we were walking right through the curtain, and I knew the camera was coming, but we he just wanted to keep walking. I was like, no, we got to turn around, get the beauty shot, one, two, three, then exit. And and then he, when I walked backstage, he was like, I taught you well. You know, but he taught me the little things like that to help me progress. And those little things is what makes you a superstar. Those little camera actions of how to, like, he would always tell me, sell up look up stop looking down like he wouldn't be like oh go do a triple moon saw da, da, da. no that's not what my dad's teaching my dad's teaching me okay when he, you sell that punch make sure you sell around to this corner put your face up make sure you make an eye contact to that red eye when you see that red eye it's on you sell 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 keep your face up little things like that that create you know wrestle great wrestlers not not just amateur wrestlers or status quo that's what creates the randy orton's the Shawn michaels the jbl's the jack briscoe's the jerry briscoe's the people that can sell their face the facial expression is all what draws the money because it shows pain it shows hurt it shows love it shows all of that they can't the fans can't see that if you're facing facing down you got to show this yeah, I always thought that Michael Jordan, one of the great greatnesses of Michael Jordan, the reason people loved him so much was not just that arguably the greatest basketball player of all time, but he looked like he loved what he was doing. You know, when he's flying through the air with his tongue hanging out and he's smiling and he's pumping his fist, that's a guy you think, I just paid a fortune to come see and it's worth every single penny because of the expression that he shows, not just what he does, but because you read it in his face. Because he loves what he's doing and he's giving everything he got. He's not just that. That's what separates the men from the boys. Uh, John, that, that's kind of what I wanted to teach to teach uh, Wes and not only Wes, but the rest of the student down there. You know, it's, it's not all the moves that you make and all that stuff. It's the preparation. It's a transition into those moves. It's the body language that you use in the ring and the expressions that you that you give the people. It's all these little intangibles that, that a lot of people don't think about. And uh, the moves are the, the to me the moves are a dime a dozen. I mean they always were. I mean even back in my day and we, we didn't have a dozen of them, dime a half a dozen <laughs> of them back in those days. But you know you made those half a dozen moves work for you. And, and and you let the people know that when you went to those half dozen moves that you knew that that was legit and they were somebody was going to get in trouble when you applied it to them. So that was the fear that 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 uh, that, that the opponents uh, fans had of you that was putting those moves on because they knew you put them on the right way. It wasn't a million moves. It was just just production of the moves, I think. And two, what I feel like has been lost too is what Booker T once told me. Booker T set me to the side. He goes, Wes, he goes, every time you step out that curtain, even if you know you're going to lose, you go out there and you think you're going to whoop his ass no matter what. Don't worry about what the card says. Don't worry about when you step through that curtain, you are the man. And, you know, those are little things that I picked up that whether you lose or not, I don't, when I come through that curtain, I come out there ready to kick ass no, no matter whatever, you know, like, and that's showing you got to come out and believe in yourself. 
And that was the main thing I think Booker T was trying to put over, but not a lot of people were listening, was that you really got to believe in yourself. It doesn't matter if you win, lose, or draw. When you step through that curtain, believe in yourself. Show the world, I'm the man. I own this stage. This is my time. And Jerry, you were there during the '90s when Shawn Michaels would come to that curtain. That was that was one of the greatest things I've ever seen to this day. I, I don't know if I've ever seen a better entrance of Shawn. You know, in the '95, '96 timeline, right. when he would come out of that curtain, it was like electricity got shot to the entire arena. It was like an explosion. It was unbelievable seeing him come out. It was just energy. You know, it's just, it's, it's hard to describe it. And like you say, Wes doesn't matter if he's going to win or lose. All of a sudden, the, everything changed when he came out. The entire yeah, and, you, and and you told and tell you what, no one could even tell. And if the, whatever the outcome was, no one could tell because a hundred percent when he walked out, you know he was going to kick some ass. Same with you and Ron Simmons. You know, then when you guys walked out, you meant business, and they knew it, whether win, lose, or draw. And you know. Sometimes you can tell when someone walks out the curtain, they already got the boo-boo face. <laughs> and you know that boo-boo face, that's not a good face to have. It's like the old cartoon when you have the crusher and you have this huge guy on these pyrotechnics going off against Bob. He's the guy in white trunks and white no knee pads. He's just standing there. <laughs> yeah. Cru crusher going to kill him. Gonna but kill John, it. you know yourself when you and Ron when you and Ron would come out. I mean, you guys had the people trained that hey, you know the the, the matches before me might have been been a little workish, but you know tonight we're gonna kick some ass out there. And you guys, the pe people truly believed that, even though in, in the in the back of their mind they knew that it was the same thing, but they knew they were gonna see some extra special. You know, same with Sean. Sean hit the, Sean hit that. You know. Uh, hit hit that music board he out for that first little little, little flex like that the place just going I mean you were you're on this tour with me when Sean was first starting to break in Germany and those little you know we drew a much younger crowd at that time over in Germany than we were drawn in the United States I think that that Germany crowd was kind of the precursor to what the American crowd kind of turned out right. to be all those little girls out there when Sean would you know, pop out of that curtain I mean, it was like, you know, the back in our days, you know, the Rolling Stones. It was out. insane. Yeah. It and was it insane. All, all it... through that, every, every night and every, every different city in Germany. So, you know, those are the little things I tried to teach Wes was more the the psychological part of it than the physical part of it. He had great coaches. Norman Smiley is a great coach. Dr. Tom Pritchard, great coach. And Dusty was a great He had the greatest coaches in the world. I'm not going to step in there and interfere. See, current with those guys that that do the that they had a pattern, and that's nothing worse. And I didn't want to because I I the thing that really helped me out. I'd been a volunteer coach at his high school, and Wes will tell you I didn't even coach him at that time. There, I let the other coaches coach him. But when I wanted when he had a bad match and he needed a needed a little rough match, I I after the coaching part of it was over come on you we're, we're gonna go six minutes you know and, and i made i made him pay you know? <laughs> but uh you know I, I but i dealt with all those parents you know one of the reasons i quit high school coaching because i had a parent come up to me and start doing that finger poking to my chest one time and it was all i could do to keep from breaking his finger off and shoving it where the sun don't shine and i didn't want to be that parent you know <laughs> and even in the pro ranks you don't want to be that parent so I respected his coaches so much, and I knew I knew he was getting the right coaching. So there wasn't, if I and like I would build. I mean, if I wanted Wes to do a different style of arm drag, I'd tell Bill I was going to help him with a different style of arm drag, so that he wouldn't get signal out. Well, you're not doing it like I'm teaching you how to do it, you know. So I would just, but the little psychological part, him and Xavier, I'd take them after a match and I'd set them down. Okay, you guys did this great. I'm not going to criticize what you're doing physically in there but you know mentally this is this is where you should have you should have picked it up or something like that you know that yeah. that's when i'd start coaching that at that time there that's what i really me and xavier and xavier will tell you the same thing is that we would love when he would come to us because it wasn't like oh you did this move wrong or you didn't sell the, the he would be like oh you didn't put this in the, the right transitions this it didn't mean sense like he would help us 
make sense of the matches because me and Xavier Woods, I mean, yeah, I'm decent size, you know, I'm all right, you know, but we're not, we're not giants. So, you know, my dad would help us psychology wise, put the right moves in the right areas and, or be like, Hey, that didn't fit here because this, 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 and he'd walk us through and then we'd be like, okay, that makes sense. And, and like, he never would be like, Oh, you messed up on your her on Corona and didn't sell to the left. I'm like that, nah, that, that, that's not my dad, you know, like he, I tell you how good your dad is. I talked to your dad, I talked to him almost every day, but talked to him about a couple weeks ago and I'd done something with Baron Corbin and Baron's a terrific young guy. Like I, I love Baron, but your dad told me something. He goes, Hey, I saw something. It was just something psychology. Uh, and, and so he told me what it was and I thought well, that makes a ton of sense. So I pulled Baron aside. I said, hey, Gerald Briscoe just told me this. Try this. And Baron, he, he can do anything. So as soon as he went out there, he tried it, did it, worked perfectly. But that was all from your dad just watching the show, probably not that intently, just watching the show and going, he needs to do this. It's just your dad has an incredible brain for this business. And you can tell you the craziest thing is when people like that, you know, help out others. I remember when I was in TNA, Stone Cold would text me all the time and be like, Wes, you know, really? that's great. And, and I was like, Steve's telling me, like, I'm like, okay, like, I better do, like, I'm like, he's watching me. I'm like, okay, I, like, my next match, I better, like, lay it, like, to know that, like, and for him to go out of his way to message me, like, I still have a copy of the message because I was like, wow, like, that means a lot. Like, he's actually paying attention to what I'm doing, you know? And uh, that was like one of the moments. And, you know, I've had a couple other, you know, great wrestlers watch my match and, you know, help critique me and help me, you know, bring me to the level that I need to be. i tell you, we had a poker uh, tournament the other day on uh, Monday Night Raw and I was hosting, you know, t uh, funny how they always end in fights and never end up in a, <laughs> you know, so somehow they always ended up uh, in, a, in a disaster. But at right when we're doing the cards and we're doing the last thing, it occurred to me I wanted to I wanted to have Luke Gallows have aces and eights for his hand and not say anything about it, just throw it down. But I didn't I didn't have a chance to clear. You know, I, I don't know if it you know there'd been any right. problem or not, but I just thought about that as soon as as, as we're <laughs> doing the last scene. I thought, damn it, I just I missed something there. You did, man. I would have been great. That'd been so subliminal. Nobody, very few people would have picked it up, but the ones that did, you'd been a, you'd been a cult hero. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. And I thought about it as they were as they were doing the scene. It was the last one we needed to get it done and in the can. And I thought, ah, oh, I missed it. <laughs> now, we had uh, we had some crazy moments. I remember when a uh, bully turned on Hogan, and we were in Chicago in a steel cage. And it was the first time ever I experienced the whole entire ring getting filled with beer cans and trash. And you can like if you go on YouTube, there's a clip on the very end. If you look, you can see the whole ring is just getting like they're just tossing stuff. I mean, that's heat. When we were aces and eights, we got heat. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Like when we were at our top peak. We, we 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 had some heat and then we became baby faces kind of towards the end but in the middle when bully turned and boy i'm never it was the craziest feeling because i i like was like man this is like nwo like this is the crazy like we had like i remember people throwing gum in, i had long hair people were throwing gum in my hair i was getting hit in the head with beer cans and we were just like we had to get security to go around and like start like it almost was a riot and it was for like for us it was just crazy to experience that and then i remember bully pulling us to the side and he's like i haven't we haven't got reaction like that in a very long time and you know being a part of the aces and eights that was a really great experience of my life because you know i got blessed to be with devon dudley he was kind of my mentor. He was the guy that I traveled with. He was the guy that I stayed with. He was the guy that really, really looked after me. Devon, I owe so much respect and I have so much love for that man that you have no idea because he took a young wrestler that was thrown into TNA 
just got really while well, i was in puerto rico wrestling in puerto rico got signed with tna went to tna and everyone was kind of like of course the aces and ace guys they're cool with me but devon really as a mentor took me under his wing devon helped me with some and like we would go to places and i would try to pay and he would already have the bill paid you know, and he knew the struggles of a, you know, a young wrestler and, and just the knowledge he would help share with me. And when we were tagging together and he would just, just tell me little things. I owe a lot to Devon. Devon is one of the greatest coaches and I'm so grateful that he's at the performance center right now, helping out all those guys because Devon has so much knowledge and he is just one of the greatest guys and one of the greatest wrestlers out there. And I'm, I'm, you know, I got nothing but respect and love for him. And I just wanted to just throw that out there. I'm glad he's at the performance center right now, teaching the youth right now. I, I don't do that many appearances when I do, if they want to get me there, they'll say Ron's here. So that's, that, that'll get me like, okay, I'll come here for the weekend. Cause I was, I love spending time with Ron. And we were at some appearance uh, recently and it was me and Ron and Devon. And I had, one of the best Saturday afternoons of my life. That was just, that was so much fun. Devon is just, he's the nicest guy. He's, he's a funny, he's smart. He's just, he's a pleasure to be around. And yeah. he doesn't mind if he's the butt of the joke or if he's the one telling the joke. He just wants to laugh. Yeah, we, we, we have some funny stories. There was one time we were doing a triple threat match. And uh, it was a time we were working with some of the UFC fighters or was it UFC or, or Pride? It was one of one of two. We had Rampage Jackson there. And uh, we did a spot where he got in. I was in a corner, and he reached over and, like, slapped me. And I got pissed. So I turned around, and I punched him as hard as I could in the ankle. And then I came back, and I'm like, Demon, I was like, I'm going to fight that guy. He's like, he, Demon's like, he's an MMA fighter. I go, Pfft. I don't care. I don't care what he is. Like, he just respected me in the ring. Like, no, we're going to have an issue. But, you know, he helped, like, squash it all out and we became friends afterwards. But, you know, like, Devon's a good, good, good guy, man. He's a really good person. Well, let me tell you what your dad did to Ron Simmons. So they're uh, at an appearance. And and Ron doesn't have his phone out or something. He wants to know the Florida State score. So they're playing some, like, you know, FCS school. And and your dad says, "Oh man, they're down fourteen nothing." Oh, I know this. Or, or or whatever the score, or everything. And Ron goes, "Really?" He goes, "Yeah, yeah." So and then anyway, second quarter, he goes, "Man, they're down twenty one seven. At least they've scored." And so this goes on for like two and a half hours. Finally, Ron goes, "Really?" And Jerry goes, "No, they play tonight." <laughs> uh-huh. Jerry had been giving him fake updates to the score. <laughs> Uh, that's my dad. I remember one time I'm in Puerto Rico and we're wrestling and it's pouring out rain and I'm out there in my boots and I'm slipping and sliding and I'm like, I come back and I'm, you know, really disappointed in my match because, you know, I wrestled in the rain and I didn't do good. I'm like, dad, what do I do? He goes, dummy, you take your boots off. I was like, I didn't know that, you know, like. Of course, you take your boots off, you won't slide on the mat because your feet will grip. But with the boots, you're sliding across the mat. Of course, he's wrestled in the rain, obviously, but I had never done it before. So, like, it was just funny when he was like, idiot, you take your boots off. But I was just like, well, I didn't know that. These damn kids nowadays. Oh, <laughs> well, Wes, it's been great having you on here. I know it's taken, uh, taken on me a long time to talk to John and letting you come on here. <laughs> <That's laughs> oh, no, he's mind. scared to have this pretty face up on here. You know, yeah. he don't want the swagger. You know, he's just scared yeah. that I might take over the yeah. Briscoe and JBL show. You know, you never know. Yeah, I hear what coming up in February, there's a big event coming up in Melbourne, Florida. It's featuring two Hall of famers that are very close to you one being your dad me and other, other than that uh, evil eric bischoff and his son so uh, the melbourne florida is going to have eric bischoff and, and uh, gerald briscoe there john what, what do you think should happen there <laughs> well you kidding me we gotta have a rematch <laughs> we gotta have a rematch <laughs> so what is the event 
Well, it is ARW. I'm going against, I'm going for the Florida heavyweight championship. And uh, I'm going to have my dad in my corner because lately the people I've been going against, they just keep jumping me and, you know, fighting unfairly. And finally, I got to bring a Hall of Famer in here to help clean up the business. So Eric Bischoff's going to be there also on the other, as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Eric Bischoff will be there. There'll be. I've a seen this movie before. <laughs> the the Oki usually wins. <laughs> no, we're, no, we're all gonna be on the same side. We're all on the same side on this one. Oh, I, I did. Uh, oh, well, Eric's come. To, he's Eric's gotten smart over the years. Yeah, yeah. Eric joined my side, John. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But yeah, we're looking forward to everybody. I'm looking forward to being in an in arena with Eric Bischoff. It's been a long time. And uh and fans down there, I mean, if you if you hadn't met Eric, uh what what a treat you're in for. What what a good guy, what a what a smart guy, and he's he's fan friendly, believe it or not. He and he he'll he, he's around for everybody to to talk to. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, Eric and I'll probably plan something where we'll try to entertain the people the best we can. And so should be a night of fun down in Melbourne Auditorium. Get out and support your uh, independent promoters all around the country here because they're the grassroots of our business. Yeah, make sure to find out any information about ARW. Follow West Briscoe on Instagram at West Briscoe 19 or follow my Twitter at West Briscoe. And make sure you check out JBL's lures. They <laughs> work great. And check out ARW and make sure you follow the podcast. And also check out the Briscoe and Big A's podcast. What we're doing, we're starting that thing back up and getting ready to go. And I just want to make sure I tell everyone, peace, love, treat everybody with respect. And I love you guys and thank you for the support.